we can. Uh, thank you. And I'm pleased to welcome Susan today. I'm going to let you uh, tell a little bit more about yourself and just jump into our topic. Um, and uh, we welcome again questions uh, in the chat and uh, unmute yourself if you have them. Uh, Susan, welcome back to Oregon, if only virtually for now. Okay, great. Well, thank you, Deb. It's great to be here again and follow up with um, some of what was presented earlier in the year. So um, today, the purpose is to really talk about capacity building within communities of practice, orient, orient you to the Every Moment Counts online building capacity course and how to implement it, and share success stories um, in the last 20 minutes or so. So as Deb said, um, I presented in Oregon to um, the eight, at the AT Ties conference. Uh, I did the keynote foundation information on every moment counts and then a session on promoting participation and health during lunch and recess. And then the afternoon, the calm moments cards, um, tuning into stress and embedding um, strategies to reduce stress and enhance emotional well-being. And then the last session was really focusing heavily on making leisure matter, the importance of healthy leisure participation for all youth. So as a follow-up today, um, the theme again is how coming together to learn and plan over time creates change. That's, that's the big challenge. A one-day conference doesn't really do a lot or um, just workshops overall. What I know is that the work occurs after the learning occurs. So, um, oh, sorry, I'm trying to forward here. So if you did not attend that April workshop, um, we, this summer, because there is a demand and people can't make workshops, we did develop a five-part webinar series that was offered live during the summer and is currently sold on demand. So um, there is a 25% discount if you purchase all five, which really gives you an overview of all of Every Moment Counts, but you could certainly purchase one at a time. So this was our way of really bringing this information uh, forward to people who can't make certain conferences. And um, you do receive contact hours from that. So this, um, there's a link. I will share this PowerPoint while you will have um, the, the PDF of the PowerPoint, which does have active links in it um, that you can access the content. So anyway, go, um, every moment counts. Um, those of you were, who were there in April, uh, I covered foundation information. It is uh, an initiative that was developed by myself and 13 other uh, occupational therapists. Uh, we were funded by the Ohio Department of Education in 2012 for three years. And during that time, we implemented all of our initiatives and evaluated them. So what is it? Um, some folks call it a program. It's not a program. It really is an initiative. It's multi-pronged with the focus on mental health promotion. Um, the focus is on also building capacity of interdisciplinary teams to apply a tiered approach to mental health, to embed these strategies and programs focusing on mental health promotion and, and prevention throughout the day and disseminate materials broadly using our website, publications, presentations, and communities of practice, which is the focus today. So um, the website, if you've been to it, it's information dense. It really is like a book. And I think it needs to be approached like a book. You, um, if you're interested in cafeteria recess, you would go to that page and go through it almost like a chapter. It's free. Um, this work was funded um, through federal dollars initially. And so we um, knew that we would wanna make the work that we developed during that time available for free. Um, sign up to stay connected on the website and you'll get updates from us. And the, so this is the second iteration of the website. Um, it has a lot of success stories from actual implementation. 
And we're excited that the website can be translated into 100 different languages. So um, we do present, um, I presented a month ago in, to Pakistan um, school personnel. So it's nice to have it accessible that way. Um, so the framework is this tiered approach to mental health, which really shifts us from thinking just about that tier three, which would be children with identified mental health disorders or children on our caseloads to really thinking about the whole student body, those with and without disabilities and mental health challenges. So tier one is how to help all children and youth be mentally healthy. Tier two strategies are targeted for those at risk, and there are many at risk populations. In fact, since COVID, the, we all know there's an increase in stress and anxiety and depression. Um, so there, there's a real need for lots of targeted services, which are often small group interventions that can occur during lunch and recess or after school and accommodations throughout the day. So this is the guiding framework for all of Every Moment Counts. And as therapists push services into the natural environment, we're actually serving the needs of all three groups of children. So if we're in the cafeteria, we may be tuning in to children on our caseload who may be struggling to participate, but we're also really focusing on promoting health, mental and physical um, in the whole student body. So this initiative was um, has been developed by occupational therapists, and we focus, um, we have a background in mental health, but we don't do talk therapy. We really do doing therapy and helping children participate in the occupations and interactions that foster health, mental and physical, within these nine areas of our practice. So when we envisioned Every Moment Counts, we knew we had to tune into play during recess. It's part of what we do as OTs, tuning into and fostering play. Active play is really important during recess. Social participation, uh, meal times, and leisure. Um, so this graphic uh, we just developed as a part of the ESSA network, which if you're interested in ESSA, we do have a national community of practice um, and information sheets. Um, there's a link to that, um, this graphic and the information sheet here. So our initiatives cover what can be done throughout the day, implemented by all. As, as Deb said, we can't have one group of professionals tuning in and, and fostering mental health. We need all school providers, from the cafeteria supervisors to um, security officers, administrators, everybody really needs to have a lens on how children are doing in terms of their emotional well-being and think about how to embed strategies um, throughout the day. And so we have a number of these initiatives. So uh, again, not everyone is a mental health provider. Deb alluded to this, but everybody has to be or needs to be a mental health promoter. And that's what, that's what Every Moment Counts is all about. So the potential outcomes from today's session is hopefully to get you to use the Every Moment Counts website content and all of our downloadable resources. Everything's free um, to help all school personnel learn about mental health promotion and prevention and embed strategies. Um, and also you can access our, our webinars. Uh, and then this, the big focus today is how to launch a community of practice to build capacity of school personnel in your school or within a district. And so I'll be covering a five month or five part online um, course series, which is free. So the key is knowing is not enough. We need to move from knowing to doing. And as an academician, as a researcher, I do think um, we often think that if we publish something, it's just automatically going to be implemented. But that's uh, we know that's not the case. It takes a lot of effort. So the information I'm sharing today um, on creating change leaders, 
is on this page of our website. You'll see under initiatives. So I have a lot of information on knowledge translation, communities of practice, and, and um, the content that I'm covering today. So we do believe that um, change leaders, everybody could be a change leader. It's not just people at the top of the rung in districts or schools. Um, and change leaders are those service providers with the knowledge and confidence empowered to change practice based on current knowledge. And so this theme actually comes a up a lot when we look at the outcomes of capacity building, that um, when people gain more knowledge within a community, they become more confident to change. So confidence is key. So we do know there's a knowledge to practice gap that it's estimated that it takes 17 years to translate evidence to practice. And when I went to a conference in 2010 on knowledge translation in Canada, it opened my eyes to the fact that, again, publications and even workshops are not enough, that we need ongoing, meaningful, focused interaction and exchange between people who share a, a shared desire to improve something. And so researchers really need to rub elbows and be very connected with practitioners at a grassroots level. And um, that's really what my focus is now. We have to be really connected at a grassroots level in schools. So I envisioned a strategic building capacity process to um, promote this application of knowledge to practice. And literature and knowledge translation um, indicates that this knowledge translation or capacity building occurs best within a community of practice um, and people getting together and reading, reflecting, dialoguing, planning, and implementing change. So the planning has to be there. Um, and the goal, again, is to move from knowing to doing. So I've been involved in communities of practice. I was involved in the National IDEA Partnership um, in the 2000, probably around 2005 to 2018, where we functioned as a national community of practice. And we actually learned from Etienne Wenger, who is um, the inventor of this concept of communities of practice. Um, so I see them as a mechanism for promoting knowledge translation. It's bringing people together in a very simple way to do shared learning and shared work. And if we would ask the question, how is that different from a leadership team? Um, it offers a different way of getting work done. They're more a little more informal. Members can be self-selected. Any person who has a vested interest in the change really should be invited and participate in the community of practice. And I see communities of practice being uh, reflecting side by side leadership versus top down leadership. So I do know um, from our experience in the state of Ohio with PBIS, uh, which the um, implementation has heavily focused on leadership teams. I do know in many districts and many schools that the information doesn't trickle down to um, the frontline workers. And so with the community of practice, you really need to involve stakeholders, anybody who is going to be um, affected by the change. So in 2011, I after I edited a book on this tiered approach to mental health, I invited um, therapists to join me in learning over time. And this was my first community of practice that occurred over six months, reading the entire book on this tiered approach to mental health. We had three face-to-face -face meetings and six online discussions. So in 2011, um, Zoom wasn't a big, I don't even know if it existed, but um, today, I think we can do so much virtually, as Deb mentioned. Um, so I implemented this process in learning together over time and sharing. And it was our collective wisdom that led to really envisioning Every Moment Counts. So we replicated as a part of the grant the six-month-long capacity building initiative 
um, resulting in over 230 change leaders in Ohio and did evaluate the outcome. So does it work? Does learning together work? We um, did pre and post surveys of knowledge, beliefs, and actions related to addressing children's mental health within a tiered framework, and also collected, um, we did some focus groups and uh, reflections. So the quantitative data um, really demonstrated that there was a significant change uh, improvement and knowledge, beliefs, and actions related to addressing mental health. So we don't want to just measure the change in knowledge, but we want to change, you know, see if there's a change in action. The qualitative data really informed, help inform or add on to our quantitative, that a change in thinking does lead to a change in doing, uh, that therapists reframed mental health as a positive state of functioning, as mental health, that they were energized, felt reconnected to ROT roots in mental health, and became more confident in knowledge and skills, empowered to articulate, advocate, and implement. So um, a lot of what came out from our um, reflections was feeling confident and empowered to change. And that's been, um, we've seen that in replications of this work in other ways. So that's then leading to what, what happened in 2018, 19. I was approached by Sarah Nielsen. I'll be showing a little bit about her in a minute. Uh, under a SAMHSA grant at the University of North Dakota, Sarah really thought, why don't we develop an online capacity building course for interdisciplinary school personnel to be mental health promoters? So this was a collaborative initiative funded again through SAMHSA, and I was a, the, a, a content expert. So this is what you can implement. It's a free online series for interdisciplinary teams, um, capacity building. Here's the website link. It's through the um, Mental Health Technology Transfer Center Network um, on the Mountain Plains area. And um, again, funded by SAMHSA. So what it involves is five webinar sessions. They're only 45 minutes to an hour with facilitation guides that can be used by the community of um, practice facilitator. So Sarah Nielsen um, and I were collaborators in this. Um, she is still at the University of North Dakota and the grant period is, is just now ending. So um, this has been going on for a while. And contributors were um, Carol Conway and Sarah Kolick, um, who contributed to session two and three. So registration is free. Um, the link that I gave you takes you to a page. You have to, you know, just develop an online a login. Uh, you obtain six contact hours. This is the Healthy Knowledge website that is um, hosted by SAMHSA. So yeah, Healthy Knowledge platform. So after you complete every session, you take a quiz and then um, you move on to the next session. So there's five, five um, parts to this and I'm gonna go through them. So with this online course, um, there is a facilitation guide for the leader. So I suggest having one or two leaders if you're going to develop this community of practice. Um, and so really the work is minimal for the facilitators. You basically have to plan the meetings. And most people now are, are doing this virtually since we're all really skilled at Zoom. And so um, the webinars, again, you would watch the webinar, either have participants watch it before you meet or during your meeting, which would um, mean that you should have an hour and a half to two hours to meet. Um, the readings, we have readings available for you. The Every Moment Counts website is so dense now that it really um, reading and using the website um, before the session um, is helpful. And then after you view the webinar with your group, or if you viewed it before, there's a discussion guide 
for um, fostering discussion and application after that session. So the five sessions, again, I'll go through very briefly. They really cover all aspects of, and just about all aspects of Every Moment Counts, our various initiatives. So the first session, um, similar to the keynote that I gave in the spring, is really covering foundation information with a heavy focus on positive mental health, what it looks like, and how to promote it based on research and positive psychology. So when we envisioned Every Moment Counts, I would say uh, a heavy emphasis, if you looked at the mental health world, was really on tier three, how to work with kids with mental health challenges. And we felt the gap was, there really was very little on promoting positive mental health in all students. You know, where are students learning about what positive mental health is, and what could they do every day to take care of it? Um, so a lot of the work on our website under embedded strategies focuses heavily on that. So webinar one covers this foundation information. Webinar two, or session two, focuses on really how does this look? What does it look like in a school? So Carol Conway is an OT and works um, very closely with speech pathologists, with uh, teachers, physical therapists, and embedding these mental health promotion and prevention strategies. So she gives examples of collaborating to um, do this work at tier one, tier two, and tier three. And Susan, I just want to clarify again, the sessions that you're talking about right now are the free ones? Yes. These okay. are free. These yes. Are free. Okay. I just wanted to point that out again because this is this is some awesome resources yes. and uh, able to do within teams um, as a big picture estate. Uh, we are uh, RSOI is happy to talk about and support uh, bigger conversations, but all of these resources for your teams um, are free. Just wanted to yes. Yes. make sure that so that is our favorite four that letter word. Yeah, the webinars we're selling on the website are longer, you could do on your own, but this th these are free. And so they are um, shorter webinars, they're not two hours, they're 45 minutes to an hour. Session three, Sarah Kolick, um, one of the co-developers of the Calm Moments cards, um, covers this whole approach of recognizing stress triggers and embedding evidence-based um, strategies to reduce stress and enhance emotional well-being. So thinking strategies, focusing and calming strategies, and sensory strategies. And then session four focuses on promoting participation and enjoyment during lunch and recess, our comfortable cafeteria and refreshing recess programs, which really focus on promoting pro-social behavior and helping kids develop the soft skills that are so important in life, like having a meaningful conversation, um, active play, respecting differences and including others. So um, they're planting those seeds and helping supervisors. A big thing here is helping supervisors be effective in their job and building capacity of those supervisors. So we can't be in the cafeteria and recess every day, but we really can impact what students are doing as well as what supervisors are doing and creating healthy environments. Um, since the pandemic, I've been hearing a lot about how children are eating in front of uh, videos in their classrooms or um, watching videos during recess. These are not healthy uh, ways for kids to participate during those non-structured times of the day. Session five focuses on leisure, which is often a forgotten occupation. And we know that children and youth who have at least one healthy out-of-school leisure activity do better socially, emotionally, and academically. And the kids at risk, um, the high-risk categories are children with disabilities and children and youth who live in poverty. So the pointers, um, these five sessions, again, are free, and um, the facilitator would review the facilitation guide, um, 
and you know plan um, these webinars um, again uh, the if you do it in a group um, there's different ways to do it if you did it individually you take the quiz to move on to the next session um, but if you did this in a group you could show the webinars just at during your zoom session so how do you develop it um, as I mentioned, you really need to identify some facility facilitators, and you're going to hear from some in the last half of this um, session, uh, therapists who have led these a community of practice. So I think having two people work together works well. You definitely want to think of who you who you like to work with. If your styles complement each other, um, being organized is important. And do you have the time for this? You know, um, in some for some of us, it just may not be the right time in our lives to um, be a facilitator. Uh, develop your community of practice. So you can do this in in different ways. I've um, done national communities of practice where I give an open invitation and market um, in schools. I've known principals who have required school personnel to participate, or you can invite. I think it's really important to have diverse stakeholders together. You want to generate excitement as the facilitator. Um, and you can either have the meetings once a month, that's how we developed it, but I do know a therapist who um, um, did the five sessions in a concentrated once a week um, type of um, setting type of situation this past June. So, you know, it's flexible. You have to make it work for you. Um, if you're meeting in person, any perks like food help, um, and CEUs. So I've been consulting with a practice and the, the um, practitioners went through this and they did receive CEUs. We gave them, we applied for CEUs in the state of Ohio. So I do think contact hours, CEUs really help motivate continued participation. Uh, the facilitation process, um, you need to find a convenient and comfortable location or time. So uh, I do find some of the, the therapists are either facilitating these at the end of the school day between like three and five or three and 4.30. Um, you need to find the time. Um, other therapists have um, implemented this in the morning, early morning hours or in the evenings. So, um, so the first kickoff meeting, make sure everyone feels welcome. So you're really facilitating a culture of sharing and, and learning together. You want people to be open with their challenges, with their successes. And then you schedule, the facilitator schedules all the meetings. And at the final meeting, we do have a strategic planning form. We really want people to be thinking about what they would like to implement, what change. So we like therapists and school personnel to think of gaps. You know, you can't implement everything at once, but really think about what are your, maybe you, what are you seeing as the biggest need in your setting? And then strategically planning implementation. We find that writing down a plan fosters um, getting things done. So this is our um, simple uh, strategic planning form that is available through this online process. And I think it's really important. I'm always fascinated by change. Um, some school personnel just jump in, they're mavericks. Others um, just need a little more support. That change is messy. We have to stay committed um, and really making routine contact, contact, I think, is critical for fostering ongoing change. So I'm going to stop here um, and see if you have questions about the online, um, the online materials and even implementing a community of practice. And then after questions, 
I do have some success stories that I'd like to share so you can hear from therapists who've implemented this, this online course. Susan, I, I I love the idea of community of practice and, of course, capacity building. And as we are all kind of uh, looking at our environments right now and people are, uh, uh, there's shortages of positions mm. um, and, uh, you know, just a lot of overwhelming factors right now. And to think of uh, capacity building is first finding your own capacity. And uh, so the ideas that we are sharing, um, of course, are better as a team, you know, as we're thinking about going into holiday break, uh, planting seeds and thinking about, again, tiny steps, what are little pieces that you can do. And across our state, we have lots of different models of delivery. Uh, some of our therapists are consult only <clears throat> in districts. Uh, some people uh, may not at this point intersect at the cafeteria where that they can support that. Um, but you and I, and one other person who's on with us today uh, has been, have been talking about um, bringing other voices to the table. And Jennifer Young, if you are able to unmute yourself, uh, Jennifer, if you would just say what your current role is. And we have been talking about sharing um, and even coming up with uh, some pilot projects that we can support Support. and we being us and uh, Jennifer with with Susan's help. So Jennifer, I'm going to be quiet a moment and just let you introduce yourself um, as part of as part of the conversation here in Oregon. Sure. Um, so I work with the Oregon Department of Education, and um, I work with a colleague of mine who's also on Krista Hawkins. We work on a CDC um, Healthy Schools grant, which focuses on um, school nutrition and physical activity and managing students with chronic health conditions. And so it seemed like um, we were hearing from some of the districts that we work with that um, there were concerns about how folks who monitor cafeterias were treating the students and the students not having enough time to eat. And um, so just started looking at resources and this one came up. So had met with Susan and then met with Deborah to try to learn more. And, you know, it just was serendipitous that Susan had done a training for folks in Oregon. Um, most, many of us that work on this are registered dietitians have not necessarily worked with occupational therapists before. And so what an amazing way to maybe collaborate on some of our efforts. And so that is what um, we're on this call today is just to learn a little bit more about what you're doing and see if maybe there is an opportunity to, um, if you're going to do a pilot project to work with you on that. I, I think that's great, Jennifer. And I do know there are some PTs here as well. And I will say that we entered schools in 1975 under special ed law. But now we have this law, ESSA, Every Student Succeed Acts, which we are listed as specialized instructional support personnel. Most states are really still not utilizing us. We are healthcare providers in schools, OTs and PTs and speech. And we have a lot to contribute to health. And so lunch and recess are critical times of the day where we can be contributing to the health of students, mentally and physically. And um, so I, I do really think collaboration is key in um, doing this, this work. I, I do know there are a lot of issues throughout the country and in other countries related to lunch and recess. Right. We have also, uh, we being RSOI, have uh, begun conversations with the statewide 
administrators for nursing uh, in schools, yeah. so school nurses. And we're talking specifically about feeding teams and how we can support feeding teams. But this falls right in line uh, mm -hmm. with that kind of work. Uh, we have through our schools and our districts, we have affinity groups uh, that are about all of those, uh, all of our intersections. So really bringing people to the conversation. I see our school nurses uh, might be uh, people who want to talk about this as well. So I, you know, I've been sharing with you some of the things that we can do to move this forward. But I certainly open up other discussion, and we want to know what your ideas are, and um, you know, what kind of supports we might need to get there. I did hear that from the chat last spring that therapists say they're on a consult model only, which I have to say, I. I have not seen that in other states <laughs> too much, but the cafeteria and recess programs really are based on a coaching model. We're, we're not doing direct services with students, but we're really within this, this whole school, or you could implement it in a small group. We're really um, tuning into children at risk as well as the whole student body and, and coaching, using coaching strategies to build capacity of the supervisors to be effective. So to me, I think it would fit if therapists can only do consult. I, I think a coaching model fits with that is my, my feeling. And I don't know um, what therapists feel about that. I'd love to know if therapists feel they could embed their services during lunch and recess. Linda, I'm so glad to see you on mute because at the state level, you get such a big picture and I, I look forward to what you have to say. There's lots of conversations around OTPT consult um, and they're Rep, uh, conversations that are deep rooted in long term conversations. And I think um, as we move forward, there should be conversations about maybe not just being, um, they need to be able to do some direct services and some of that coaching. Um, but that's certainly not kind of the way it's been in our state for a long time. So, um, I hope maybe at some point we could change that, but um, it would take lots of different conversations and lots of input, but um, yeah, that consult model, that's deeply rooted in our state. And I do think Linda, other I know Manaz, I don't know if Manaz is here today, is doing a lot of integrated services. And what I know from therapists implementing coaching and co-teaching in the classroom, is that teachers and others learn best by observing us do what we know how to do. So by just telling someone to do something differently who is not a therapist who might not have that skill set, implementation is more difficult. But if we show them, if we demonstrate, then we see others are like, oh, yeah, I can do it. Mm -hmm. So I do really think co-teaching, and we have that information on our website, and we see therapists doing more and more push-in, which is part of the least restrictive environment, it's part of the law, that it's, it's really effective. So in addition, you know, over the years, the uh, the support and the shells for our um, uh, our low incidence population of orthopedic impaired, the it, the shalls and the maybes have really changed and now uh, so much of it again with the support from coming from our service district partners it it is that is where it's at and so making that change uh mm -hmm. chris i look forward to hearing what you have to say as well so i see that um pts and ot's um in my school district we i'm sure i'm speaking for <laughs> everybody they're um really barely, you know, keeping above their head above water with the kids that are on their caseload. However, we do see climates within the schools that could be changed. I love this program. I've looked, I mean, I listened to you last time you presented and um, brought it to 
some principals and spoke to my, you know, immediate supervisor about it, the director of SPED. And, you know, the thing is, I feel like they have to really, or they have to buy it. If they and buy it, meaning I know it's free, but they have to buy in. Yes. Because if they would buy, if the principal would buy in, in any one of my seven schools, then I'm all for it. I would collaborate. I would, I would be so happy with it. Um, however, I do feel that I cannot just go into a school and say, okay, everyone's going to turn the TV off at lunch. I mean, it's not my place to do that. And I would, in fact, they would probably be like, what do you think you're doing? Yeah. <laughs> so I, I think having somebody here from the state level who's involved, um, you know, with state policies and can even, you know, also if maybe our supervisors hear it from, you know, us and then above, you know, that would be fantastic. Like, this is a great program. It's free. Let's do it. Yeah. So, well, Chris, what you're saying is absolutely true. I have, we have never had a principal say no to the comfortable cafeteria refreshing recess programs in our experience, because these are challenging times of the day. But what the other thing we always say, Chris, is we have to look for the open doors. Who is if if we go buy a classroom and a, and the kids are watching TV during lunch, if we have a relationship with that teacher and say, hey, how about would you be open to me posting a conversation starter once a week? That's a very small step. Mm -hmm. um, I have another example: an OT assistant overheard a teacher in one of her the classes of the kids she, a couple of kids she served say, my students can't, aren't concentrating, they're angry, they're shutting down, they're not listening to me. So she went in and, and did some deep breathing, like five minutes or yoga pose. And she did it enough in a very organic ways that the teacher ended up implementing that on her own and saying, you know what? My students are learning. I know how to manage their, you know, how they're feeling. So that that is the empowerment that we want to see. And so it can, it really needs to, we need to demonstrate those success stories. But also if you do some communities of practice, say you started some and, you know, find the schools and the people who are, are passionate about this, I would invite special ed directors and principals um, Again, they have to they have to learn about our value. And so when we when we implemented the comfortable cafeteria the very first time, when we did an in service with the cafeteria supervisors, the principal was there. It was a forty five minute meeting, and that you know the shift in changing a culture in a school does involve key stakeholders. Yeah. Yep. That, I agree. Because and I think you're going to hear a lot of people saying, well, you're speaking to the choir here. We know that these things yeah. are possible. And how do we move them forward whenever we can't get everybody at the table? So all of these things are real. And go ahead, yeah. Chris. No, I, I just was going to agree that I think if, if the principal's in the meeting, then it's going to get done. Because frankly, I mean, in our buildings, we can't even have meetings unless we ask you know, we, right. The principals, it's their, it's their staff, their staff time, you know, and yeah, yeah. I agree with what you're saying. It's great program. But I've had a lot, a lot of times assistant principals are overseeing lunch and recess and they're, uh, you know, I've, I've had assistant principals crying to me because they're struggling so much with um, office referrals during lunch. And so we have had, um, there were some therapists in Chicago, they did document a decrease in office referrals following the program. We really looked at some different outcomes, which are on our website related to the cafeteria and recess. It's all about participation and which are the children who are struggling during that time. Um, any questions about, like, I think the key is, are there some therapists or teachers or you know, who are willing, interested in implementing a community of practice using this five online series. And I would say a nice time to kick off is January, by the end of January, maybe every three weeks. Once a week is 
a, a lot of time. So time is also one of the hugest factors of preventing change because change, it does take effort. It takes planning. So I think every three weeks might be nice. Um, and when I've implemented them, I, I do have to feel kind of like a cheerleader. <laughs> You have to like Dev is really good. Dev is energetic. And I think we have to just really pull people in, get them excited. And then when we share success stories, um, then therapists and personnel see from each other the neat things that they're doing and it motivates people. Oh, I can do that. Um so and, and so we know, and I'll say again, that the professional development and the echo tie sessions, all of the topics that we bring are because you all ask for it. And some uh, sometimes it's going to be learning that maybe it doesn't fit into what I'm doing right now, but I've learned something. And yes, I'm getting credit, but it could also be that it, it really launches something. And we're not here. I personally am only here to bring you uh, professional development and information to put in your memory bank. And uh, so we are not trying to say that you have to do this, right. obviously, giving you education and information. And you tell us what it is that we need to move forward with or how we can support it. Um, maybe Jennifer has some ideas, maybe our nurses will. Um, but this is a conversation and a discussion. And it is up to you to let us know uh, what you might need or if the timing is not right to do this. What's the best link that do you think to share with, or the best initial thing to share with um, a supervisor or a director or a principal? Um, usually I start with the conversation. Um, can I, can I meet with you for 10 minutes? And this is, this is my idea. I like the word pilot. Pilot makes it just sound not as big. I'd like to pilot this free online um, series with a community of school providers who are interested in mental health promotion, health promotion in children and youth and how we can work together. So I would have your little spiel together, um, maybe with, uh, we do have a one page information sheet on this series, as well as we have an information sheet on every moment counts. When we did the cafeteria program, I did exactly that the very first time in 2012. I had an information sheet on what the program involved, and we have one on the cafeteria program. I shared it with the principal and said, we'd like to pilot this. This is what it takes one day a week for six weeks. We would orient. We need 45 minutes to an hour with the cafeteria supervisors. You know, you, know, you make your spiel. And um, so I think... When we have a relationship with someone, that's really almost an instant in because if you have a positive relationship, people don't like to say no. <laughs> so I would pick a team like in a school. If you work in various schools, pick a school where you feel that you've been there a while, you have some relationships. Um, and you know what? It ends up being so much fun. Um, in terms of size of a community of practice, we've had anywhere from eight to 10 to 15 to 20. I think anything over 20 decreases the amount of time for sharing. So um, Sarah Nielsen, in, when we developed the series, part of that grant was implementing it in rural schools, five states and out on the West. And um, we had teams and we did this all virtually, it was before COVID of anywhere from eight to again, 15 interdisciplinary school personnel, which I think makes it very rich. Does that help? 
We are we're going to continue with discussion. Uh, you have my email. We uh, could everyone can certainly uh, bring back your thoughts. Uh, let us know. Again, we I'm not here to sell anything, only to educate and help us to think about uh, ways that we can uh, partner. You know, a lot of people are at the expert model in their district that somebody comes in and they take care of things. But I think we also know the power of uh, collaboration. And and yes, there are obstacles. And uh, in my rose colored glasses, I think that uh, there is going to be a way to continue these conversations, but it's only if you uh, see a way to make them move forward. Yeah. And I will share the link to, um, to the, someone asked in the chat to the, the um, online course. I'll share that once I have the ability to, I'm in the PowerPoint right now. So should we move on with some examples of who who has done this? I think yes. Okay. So um, let's go on. So this is oh that's this is the link to it. You'll have it in the PowerPoint, and I'll share I'll share it with you again, and I'll take you to this page. Um, here's some success stories. I will say that I just started a national virtual community of practice. Uh, we had our first meeting in November and the theme was building capacity. So if you're interested in being a part of this virtual community of practice, we'll have probably three meetings a year. And we had over 70 people um, at our first meeting across the country. Um, the theme was capacity building. The next theme will be cafeteria recess. And um, I don't know if we have, I might come back to this, but this is a three, uh, I don't know. How, how many of you ha have seen this video? Comfortable cafeteria creating. Um, here's what supervisors say. Oh, you haven't? Okay, how about I show, I show this and... Um, and it could be just the size clip that you might want to include in your discussion for uh, right. and share with people in an email or some type of an introduction that three oh, minutes right. is a good overview and it could be the thing, just the thing to help them see. I'd say yes, Susan, go ahead. Okay, so this is the page for the comfortable cafeteria and I would approach this like a manual. We could have just put all of our materials in a manual and sold them, but we, we know that a lot of school personnel don't have the money. So, and these are at pictures of actual implementation. So we have posters and bookmarks, coloring sheets, and the kids love the bookmarks, which really foster literacy. They're reading about what it is we want them to feel and participate in the cafeteria. It's, it's time for them to enjoy their meal and be with friends and learn to be respectful and responsible. So all of our video vignettes are here on the left side. And we actually do have one. Here's what a principal has to say. But I want to show you this one because um, you'll hear from supervisors. Let's tell me if you can't see this, but I think you should. Are you seeing and hearing this? You should be fine. It's three minutes. I learned that everyone has different feelings. And I can see and hear it, Susan. We're good. That you have to be helpful and not to make fun of people, not bullying and be yourself. Be kind to your friends. Stand up for them. Use good manners. Help other people. The whole purpose of the Comfortable Cafeteria Program is to create an atmosphere in which children enjoy their meals at school. An important part of my job was to educate the cafeteria supervisors about how to accomplish this. It was a school-wide approach, so children with and without disabilities participated in it. Hi, I'm Dawn. I'm a cafeteria supervisor at Parma Community Schools. Hi, I'm Debbie, and we've been working with the occupational therapist to provide and promote a comfortable cafeteria environment. I think the program has increased normal conversation with the children. They like the intervention, and I think they look forward to it. Yes. I see the attempts from the kids to try new things and to gather to different tables to make friends with the other children. I thought that was really great. 
I think it's helped me in the sense outside of the children that we're working with, with the program, I will implement it in the other grades. I'm always trying to encourage them to try something new. Why don't you go sit with that friend over there? I see that there aren't too many people over there. Why don't you go sit with them? And then you can learn more about them. And so it's great for me to encourage them. This is what that's you know, that. all they need is a little right. encouragement. This is right. their social time. And this is the it's time to make a difference. Hi, my name is Ashley Raven. I'm the speech therapist here at Parma Community Elementary School. I had the opportunity to collaborate with the occupational therapists at our school in implementing this program. Um, I've definitely seen a, a huge impact in the cafeteria. Um, the students are excited to go to lunch. As the speech therapist, I found the most valuable part of this program was um, how it really fostered valuable conversation. So it really made them aware of appropriate things to talk about. Healthy conversations during mealtime is, is a life skill mm -hmm. you'll have to have forever. So mm -hmm. explicitly teaching it during this program is mm -hmm. such a valuable experience for these kids to have. Yeah, there were a few students on my caseload and I had noticed a definite change in them from the beginning of the year until now. Um, they're more comfortable sitting with their peers. They're having more conversations. Um, they're more comfortable eating around their peers. And I've definitely seen an, an increase in these positive behaviors in some of my students. Mm -hmm. Oh, um, I want to go back to the PowerPoint. So um, what's really important about this program, again, is building capacity of who do we want to change or influence? It's those cafeteria supervisors. So we usually start with one grade in a school and then maybe repeat it a second time with another grade. Um, so sustainability is, is always a huge issue. And I do recommend that schools have a cafeteria and recess committee that might meet twice a year to really keep a pulse on what's going on during that time. And I have known therapists who've um, worked with the principal in actually interviewing new supervisors and orienting them at the beginning of the year. So I think that's where the culture shift of sustainability comes in. So I love that. I love that video because even in a six week, one day a week program, we can shape what children are learning. And they're not, it's not a, it's a mini lesson. That's three to five minutes and how supervisors um, interact with children and youth. So these are therapists at our first uh, Every Moment Counts community of practice who have implemented this um, online series. And just very quickly, I mentioned Sarah Nielsen with the grant, SAMHSA grant. Um, they've implemented it, well, I think, 25 times since 2019 in this group of states. And they meet once a month for five months between four and six. And so this is all done virtually in rural schools. And the outcomes, of course, they had to collect um, pre and post outcomes and um, what they found statistically significant improvements in action beliefs and knowledge related to addressing mental health in schools. Um, so in terms of continued work, all schools identified one to two action steps and completed them. Many schools connected with each other um, and stay in touch. Um, that even after the five part online series, there's a need to stay connected and refresh. So that's, that's the key. Sustainability is always a challenge. How do you continue? You make some great changes, but, but what, um, what do you have in place to sustain that, that change? This is an OT in Boston who implemented it as a part of her capstone. This was a post-professional capstone. So I will just give a shout out. If you have um, graduate students, OT, PT, speech, um, put them to work in implementation. So she implemented this online series with therapists from 10 different states. So she did this um, kind of nationally and it was part of her capstone research. And um, 
So here, her findings were very similar, significant changes in uh, knowledge and action, um, renewed confidence in addressing mental health. And then I'm not sure if we have time, Deb, but this is, um, I have a video of Sarah Green in Minnesota really seeing that they, uh, they weren't really addressing um, mental health and that therapists weren't a part of promoting mental health in schools. So um, I have a video of her talking about implementing this at seven minutes, and I'm not sure if we have that time. I have time. I think that having it as, as a link in the um, in the resource when we share the handouts is probably good. Right now we have about nine minutes, and um, I think uh, uh, again sharing this, but also allowing people to uh, ask more questions. I, again, I think that just about everyone on here can see a need for these type of interactions whenever we look at um, our the demographics of our the kids across our state and um, the the school wellness and it and you know I'm, I saw this morning where there's a new suicide prevention and of course that may seem like a leap but by helping people feel a part of the community through these type of activities sit with each other I mean it seems like very simple promotions um, but it just it, it really feels like um, time for to have these discussions um, and maybe the time to implement them. Um, people may need to have more time to think about it and to talk about it. So if anyone has questions or comments, uh, uh, please feel free to type in the chat box or unmute yourself. And Jennifer, I'm uh, Jennifer Young. I'm hoping that uh, you, and th through learning uh, about what we're talking about, I hope that you have some ideas that you can share with us as well. One of the things that I was just thinking about when you mentioned the suicide prevention is ways to tap into other communities of practice or other initiatives that are important. Even, um, you know, I know in Oregon, we've done a lot of work with breakfast after the bell and, um, you know, bringing kids into the cafeteria for meals. Um, so, so just different initiatives. I know that there's, there's several um, groups that have been working with the schools around suicide prevention and mental health. And, and it just seems like there's so many tie-ins for this, so when you think about multidisciplinary teams or um, communities of practices in schools where you already have an in, I think that might um, might just support the opportunity when you're talking to administrators as well. Mm -hmm. And personally, I just, I mean, I love this idea. I think that, especially since recess and the cafeteria component is the pieces I'm most interested in. Um, you know, looking at pilots, looking at where we can maybe help support some of this work would be really important. And those, as you said, those are areas where a lot of bullying takes place because the time might not be as structured. And we know that we are not going to immediately affect change where people turn off the their TVs or their takeaway phone, but just planting seeds. Um, you know, when we first started talking about uh, the emergency planning for our kids, it was, okay, PTs are doing this all on their own. How can we bring other people? And all of a sudden, uh, there's something going on at the state level that supports it. And I, I just, again, bring the conversation about um, and just seeing where it can go. That's the power of uh, what we're talking about today. I see um, that there's a comment in the chat, uh, Tara. It's she's talking about a student who struggles, and again, I know we are all uh, it, feel these, uh, um, see these scenarios and the possibilities. But if you'd like to unmute yourself and just uh, just see from your perspective, um, tell us about your comment. 
I have a student who struggles during recess interacting with other students. And so I think this would be an op a wonderful opportunity to kind of coach staff in providing meaningful activities or facilitating engagement or social skills with other students. Because when staff do help support him when they're close by, he does do better. And also, I know in my cafeterias, like at my middle school, they have a a monitor, a student monitor who's checking in with behaviors and she's leaving to go to another school district and staff are giving her positive comments about how much she's helped with students' behaviors during um, the cafeteria time. So I just think these are also wonderful opportunities for us to get involved. And, and just collaborate. taking a look at the environment, um, and you mentioned this, Susan, I, it stuck with me that maybe the line to get something takes the, the kids with them uh, by a table full of bullies. Now, I'm you just looking at how are things set up? Now, when I'm going to empty my tray or throw away my trash, is my environment such that I'm setting kids up for something um, instead of uh, maybe just moving a few things around in the cafeteria that eases some of that uh, anxiety? Sorry. One of my schools in a different school district, they would have someone read a story during lunchtime, and that really seemed to help bring the noise levels down. I know students aren't interacting as much, but they have such a short amount of time to eat that focusing on eating and nutrition is important as well. And it's kind of calming to have someone reading a story to the whole group. Yeah. So what I was going to share just um, so the cafeteria and recess programs. Um, let me go back to that. Um, I mean, they really are about, um, are you seeing my screen? I'm not sure, uh, maybe not, but- um, We were seeing something, but I don't think it's what you yeah, really intended okay. to share. Yeah, um, they really are about environment-focused intervention, which there is research coming out of Canada, Mary Law's work and others. Um, and I think as therapists, we, we've done this all along. When we change the environment, we can foster participation. And Tara, what you were saying, as far as, you know, we do embed PBIS strategies. And what we know is the more adult presence in the cafeteria or recess, positive adult presence, we will see a decrease in behavior problems. And so one of the things we do, and we have information for like week one of the cafeteria and recess is on active supervision. So we've been into a lot of cafeterias and if supervisors are just told, go in the cafeteria and catch, you know, help kids not fight or, you know, it mainly it, uh, most supervisors are reactive. They're addressing behavior problems, but active supervision involves teaching them that they need to work the crowd. They need to walk around the cafeteria, smile at the kids, call them by name, these are little changes that are powerful and kids are happy you know so um, this is all a part of what we're teaching um, active supervision adult presence so when we know a pbis principal if there are a group of students or a high risk area like waiting in line we went into one school and the assistant principal was always present and would go up and down the line and high five the kids and talk to them. That's a strategy for decreasing behavior problems. So these are all the things that we focus on and coach. Um, and we also, as far as students, making them a part of the change. So week four of the cafeteria program is respecting differences and including others. We have to work with the peers as much as the kids with disabilities in fostering inclusion. So we know that the kids that are bullied are usually kids who have some differences, whether it's religious, cultural function. And if we taught all children to learn how to be kind and respectful of differences, then I think we would have less bullying.